Hello, hello, hello. Apparently I'm live. That's fantastic. That's great. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Well, I'm used to talk to an audience when people are sitting in front of me and usually they react. That's fantastic. But I'm still not used to do online uh, broadcasts, even though I've been doing it for the last six months. I'm still used to thinking there's an audience sitting in front of me and going, woo, and everything. Anyway, hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, which was entitled Treason in Treason is Fun, and I renamed it Backstabbing a Friend as a Social Activity is Fun. Just as a quick check, my microphone is working. I'd say yes. If you can hear me clearly and nicely, just put a thumbs up in the chat. I'd say yes. If my microphone's not working, say so as well. But according to my test and everything, all is fine and dandy. That is great. So let's start. My talk today is going to be about corp game design, backstabbing your friends as a social activity is fun, or treason is fun, or what can we as game designers learn from modern cooperative board games? And uh, don't be shy and please use the chat to ask questions or to give or to give feedback. But also keep in mind, I'm not always checking the talk in the chat. I mean, because uh, during the talk, I get very passionate about the subject. And sometimes I forget that there's actually an audience sitting and asking questions on Teams. That's uh, so don't be afraid to ask questions or give feedback. But I'll try my best to see what people are asking. If I'm not answering questions, I'll do my best as well to answer over email or Discord or Teams or any chat after this. Anyway, hello everyone again. My name is Oliver Simonizic. I'm a lecturer in computer science and games and the admission officer at the School of Computer Science at the University of Lincoln in the UK. My background is usually a lot, a lot of coding, a lot of C++, a lot of C Sharp, a lot of programming. But over the last, uh, actually, 10 years, I've been playing more and more and more video games. No, not more video games. I've been playing video games since, oh, I'm five or six years old. I got more and more into board games. And uh, just check here. I do have, actually, a board game set up for tonight behind me, which is uh, Glomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, which is a fantastic RPG slash dungeon crawler and over the past 10 years i started to collect quite a lot of board games and just checking by the amount that i've got in my shelves actually it's not that much because i started to put the games that i'm not playing in a different room and those are actually the games that i've been recently playing there are some new titles uh, such as pendulum transform Oh, Terraforming Mars, actually, already two years old. Dinogenics, Wingspan Extension, stuff like that. Also, more older games. And no, you won't find the typical stuff like Monopoly or Scrabble, stuff like that. And I've been playing all kinds of games. Actually, people could even say over the past 10 years, it's been a bit of a golden age of board game design because there's so many stuff that is being produced, so many awesome games. And they're getting better and better and better at it. Because, yeah, over the last, um, at last year, actually, a lot of board game stuff happened. Because so I just have to look at uh, how board games are being represented in televisions. For instance, we've got Big Bang Theory, and actually they're playing board games.
My microphone has cut out. That's not really great. And I've been talking for three minutes about games and stuff. Hey, hey, technical problems. That's not good. Anyway, that didn't happen last time. Sorry for that. Yeah, I've been talking about how board games have evolved, how things have changed. About uh, how imp the importance of digital tabletop games, how that's being popular in media. And amongst us, how that was inspired most likely by social deduction board games. So for that, anyway, I'm going to move now rooms. So let's move upstairs because I just wanted to have a brief introduction of board games downstairs. It's now on. Thank you very much for the comments, guys, because otherwise I wouldn't know that the microphone is off. That doesn't happen in real life, as in uh, when doing a talk in a room full of students. Hey, moving rooms. I hope that my PC doesn't randomly crash. Uh, uh, uh. Because I wanted to change room, it's a bit easier up here in my own little computer room, also surrounded by board games. And also I can see my second screen, so I can find out if my microphone suddenly crashes. All right. So let's continue with the talk. Oh, it's great because now I've got my screen and everything. It's much easier than doing it on the laptop. All right, cooperative board games isn't something new. It has been around for, for more than, well, actually since board games exist. And uh, there's co a couple of popular ones. And um, for instance, we've got Firewatch, uh, a popular game where you play fireman as corp and you've got to go around, save people, extinguish fire. Uh, the next one is Betrayal at the House of the Hill, which I'm going to talk about as well, which is a fantastic exploration game, horror game. You've got Glomhaven, fantastic RPG, which I keep playing downstairs as well. Uh, Dead of Winter, Pandemic, those are all co-op games with hints of competition as well. But the idea is, let's find out what makes those co-op games actually really fun. What are the little things that in game design that we can use from board games and re-implement them in a different environment like video games. And uh, as usual, I've got to have a, a bit of a definition somewhere at the start of a presentation, because I keep talking about co-op games, about board games with cooperative element, because in cooperative board games, the main idea is that players collaborate either on their own or in a team in an attempt to beat the game system whilst beating other players too. That makes sense, even in Among Us, you're basically a team trying to figure out who the suspicious people are and kicking them out of the spaceship. Usually those games have rules to reach conditions for losing the game. The players need to prevent the game mechanics from reaching those conditions while taking action to slowly reach the player winning condition. Strategies that make good use of players' ability as a team are more effective. Sometimes there is a traitor element, so the backstabbing element, where one player or more player trying to stop or corrupt other players from reaching the victory condition so that it can earn a selfish player victory. So hey, those games are incredibly fun because they, stimu they simulate, they stimulate, sorry, collaboration, cooperation, communication, and backstabbing amongst the player. Fun stuff, incredibly fun stuff. And by the way, to make sure that my microphone doesn't cut off again, I'm gonna just quickly plug in power even though it's That's good, that's good. However, in terms of game design, there's a couple of assumptions that we can uh, that we can have. Actually, wrong assumptions. So for instance, even when player playing a collaborative game, players may still have a mindset of competition because they used to play games competitively where it's all about winning over other players, all about being number one. Doesn't matter if it's competition, uh, cooperation, it's all about the competition. It's all about winning, 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 winning. And uh, in corp games, very often it's a liability to have that mindset. That's an assumption, though. And the other assumption is that co competitive players in those corp games should fail. And game design should underline that this it is a selfish behavior that will lead to everyone failing. And failing, everyone failing, that's actually not fun at all and uh, people don't want that. But those assumptions are very often wrong, and there's a recent shift that players are becoming more and more interested in games with strong social elements, with people talking to each other, with people planning, 
with bits of cooperative gameplay. So for instance, the BBC has recently had an interview with a couple of Among Us players, and they even said that um, players are a bit bored of uh, playing games, competitive games with their friends. But actually in competitive games, even if they play with their friends, everyone is more or less on their own. They're just doing their own stuff in order to win the game. Whereas you've got games like Among Us, where it's all about a team, trying to find out who the suspicious people are, kicking them out of the ship. There's a lot of talk, a lot of discussion. There's lots of ways to manipulate the social aspect in between players. And that's what people want nowadays. Could be as well that with the recent lockdown, there's been a change in uh, players' behavior in what players want, that they want to find more social games instead of uh, killing each other in a competitive Counter-Strike or Rocket League game. Actually, in Rocket League, you don't really kill each other. So yeah, it leads to cooperative game elements being incorporated in competitive games. And there's a lot of evidence in recent games. I'm thinking about um, Red Dead Redemption 2, which has got an online version. And you can play with other people and create like teams of uh, bandits or heroes going around and playing co cooperative mission, fighting other people, fighting other teams, fighting against the game. And it's actually really fun. It's basically a competitive game, but actually it does have a lot of cooperative elements. And uh, however, though, that leads to a question, like what direction may, play, may game designers take to address the fact that players are no longer surprised by a game which everyone must win or lose together? And the big question is, what happens when games are designed around the idea that players' default mode of play is the selfless rather than the selfish? So what I'm going to do now is uh, explore game design ideas to reflect a better understanding of the medium of games using board games, a lot of board games. But before that, a little bit of history. There's a game, a fantastic game that came out in 2001 called Lord of the Rings. Yeah, uh, around that time also a massive movie came out. And if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, Oh boy, you're in for a treat. It's a fantastic trilogy. I'm not going to talk about it uh, too much, but the board game was fantastic as well. It, it followed the story of Lord of the Rings and introduced a tension between individual and team utility to face the problem of bringing the one ring to Mordor in a cooperative slash competitive way. It also allowed players to make choices independently of their team to further highlight the problem of competitiveness. You're playing as Hobbit, you're playing as Gandalf, you're playing as one of the heroes of the story. You want to be the hero that saves Middle Earth. But at the same time, if you're too heroic on your own, the game is going to punish you and you're going to lose as a team. But that's a good thing at the same time because the game allowed players to trace back the payoff to their decisions because it could be a moment where you decide as a Hobbit to go down a particular path on their own, but actually doing that will save everyone else. And that is fantastic because you can play for two or three hours that game and find that that moment that saved everyone's ass. And that is fantastic. It's almost like playing the movie. It provided players with different abilities and responsibilities and encourages team members to make selfless decisions. Yep. Very often you have to think shit. Sorry for sorry. Uh, sorry, the only actions I need to do at this point is I need to do a selfless decision. I need to go in and sacrifice myself for the greater good for everyone to be saved. And my microphone decided to die again. Hey, hey, hey. Even though it's plugged in, it was working all week. Ah, that's the fun of life stuff. Anyway, that those game design elements didn't just suddenly disappear overnight. Game designers continued to build and evolve on them. I go have a screenshot of actually, a picture of a game called Marvel Legendary that came out in 2000. 12 and it uses the same design element it's all about competitiveness about being selfish recruiting the best marvel heroes and then suddenly the game shifts in mid game where you have to play in cooperation with other players otherwise you get overwhelmed by the villains trying to destroy the city slash 
whatever story that is happening within the game. And uh, that game has been around since 2012, and there's endless expansion packs. They still keep releasing expansion packs this year, and they already have announced a couple next year. Fantastic cooperative slash competitive game. And those design elements also exist in video games. I've got a screenshot here of Left 4 Dead 2, actually Left 4 Dead 2, not the first one. Also uses bits of competition, cooperation, but uh, the first one was really, really punishing because the moment you took a selfless, a selfish decision, the entire team was at jeopardy. And the moment you decided to go on your own, you were as good as that. However, the number two changes that slightly, and it's a bit easier to have a mixture between uh, selfless selfishness. So yeah, instead of focusing and forcing cooperation, why not look at communication and information, trust, task work. So we could look at game design elements of ways of hindering, hindering cooperation, corrupting cooperation, complicating cooperation. So there's a couple of elements we can look at uh, communication and information, how to change that and make that more interesting. Because when playing a game, players adapt their social interactions and communication. They change, they seem to run different mindsets simultaneously. There's the normal person, as in, uh, if I start playing again, there's Oliver and there's gameplay Oliver. And I get absorbed within that, like me doing the talk right now, I'm very, very absorbed in, uh, the talk I'm very in, but there's lecture Oliver and there's uh, social Oliver, but it's the same in game, there's social Oliver and there's game Oliver. And uh, this leads actually to a couple of different types of uh, chatter. So for instance, there's game relevant talk, game irrelevant talk, like players discussing, disconnected from the game, the social professional lives, how the day is, like and say, hey, Scruffy, Ruffy, how are your day? How are brick rest, how are you doing? So it's basically stuff that's not related to the game at all. But there's also game commentary talk, like players talking about the aspects of the game without competitive intent, saying like, hey, that's a good move, that was very good. Or let's discuss the game design. I don't like how the game works that way. Basically, it's irrelevant. Some stuff are irrelevant, some other stuff are all about the game. But there's also role-playing talk, and I absolutely love that, when people get into the character that they're playing, that they're chatting a lot, using the player's voice, using the character's voice, changing their behavior, their habit, just to be that person that they are within the game. And that adds a lot to the game itself. And there's also playful competitiveness slash cooperative trash talk. Yes, that leads a little bit to toxicity. It's players engaging in various forms of insult and criticism meant to increase the collective enjoyment of the game. They trust each other that it is part of the game. Yeah, I do that a lot when I'm doing lectures as well. Whenever I pick on somebody in the room and I make fun of that person, but that person, no, it's just a bit of playful competitiveness slash cooperation just to, as part of the lecture to make things fun of that. Yeah, I can't really do that when doing lectures online. I can't just really pick a person that is in the chat. Well, I could do that, but I'm not doing it. Anyway, those are all the communications that exist within the game. And I just unplugged my microphone. Well done, Oliver. So yeah, the first idea would be, why not make communication collaboration harder by regulating how players are allowed to communicate? and in what way they can communicate. So we can look at the four different types of communication, just say, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. Or if you're doing it, you're only allowed to role play your character. There's a lot of service. I mentioned Red Dead Redemption, but there's a lot of service, for instance, in World of Warcraft, where you're forced to play the, to role play the character that you're playing. That's actually, sounds a bit nerdy, but that's really fun just to be the orc and just be that silly orc with four intelligence. And uh, yeah, being a bit silly. And that's actually a bit of fun. However, the additional care must be taken that restrictions on communications about game information are not ineffectual. Because this leads about information. And yes, Rex, I do believe my students. And now that I see you in the chat, I'm gonna pick on you all the time. I know who, you, who the person is sitting behind that name. Fantastic. All right, so everyone bullies Rex as part of the fun of this lecture. So game information, there's information that is private. So information that is known to only one player, but unknown to the rest. There's hidden game information, information that is part of the gameplay that players must figure out. Again, amongst us example about who the suspicious person are, and you slowly find out who it is. There's also randomly generated information, information that's hidden from all players. 
something that has not been determined yet, like a card that may or may not be drawn and played by the ball. Could be information about who the traitor is. Could be that there is a traitor among us, but it could be that there's none. We don't know until that information has been randomly chosen and revealed to players. And that leads to another game out there. Allow players to make information hidden from each other. And that can lead to interesting decision because it balanced the benefits of hiding information with the increased challenge of the collaboration. So for instance, I'm playing a card game and uh, instead of revealing that card to everyone, I put it down, hidden and revealed as a trap. Yes, Re Yu-Gi-Oh reference here. But that's, it. that's interesting because as me as a player, I get the decision, do I want to reveal that information or do I want to keep it hidden? But at the same time, by putting the card hidden in a particular play area, it also gives a little bit of information to the player. Ooh, what is this? Is that important? Is that a big trap? And that's incredibly fun to do. But this also links to the first game design idea about communication. Limit communication about game information that are private, hidden, and randomized. Because you could even say, I'm limiting communication completely. And the only communication that is allowed between players is trash talk. So why not have a game where it's all about putting information hidden, but at the same time, we're playing that card hidden or that ability hidden. You have to trash talk or say something really fun about it. Yep, like bullying, bullying the other player. Actually, a game where communication is just all about bullying in a playful way. However, beware, because players, especially in a cooperative game, they want to share information with each other. They don't want to play the idea that they are limited by the game rules about not sharing too much information. It's a co-op game, so people think I'm going to share as so much information to my other teammate to ensure that we're going to win the game. And even though there's rules against it, sometimes it could be that the players are trying to avoid those rules or giving more information a different way. That can happen. I see that a lot in a lot of uh, RPG games where you're not allowed to tell what you've got in, a, in your cards. But at the same time, you're allowed to say, hmm, I've got very good chances to win this, which already more or less says that you've got the ultimate trump card in your hand. So what you need to do is adapt your game design so that individual players' communication do not overshare information that remain private. And a good example for that is a card game called Hanabi. In Hanabi, it's quite a simple and easy card game. It's all about building fireworks by having a series of numbers with the same colored cards in your hand. But the twist is you can see what cards everyone else has got in their hand, but you cannot see which cards you've got as a player in your hand. And that is fantastic because you've got to communicate to other players what they've got, which card they should play, while it's listening to other players, while making sure you're choosing the right cards in your hand that you can't see and pass to other players. And that's fantastic because there's a lot of trolling, a lot of uh, chatting, a lot of making sure one person wins, the other person loses. And it's a fantastic card game. It's actually quite easy to get and to learn and uh, quite cheap in the shops as well. Definitely recommend Hanabi as an example for player communication and hidden information. Which now leads, we discussed about uh, communication and information. The second bit is trust. I absolutely love trust. The idea is seeding trust because trust and collaboration. Well, those are two things that work hand in hand because you collaborate with somebody else. So of course you've got to trust that person. You've got to trust in the other person's decisions and abilities. You've got to trust that the other person is doing the best decision to win the game and that they're not trying to backstab each other. And interestingly, that leads stays important on social level as well, because if player around the table distrust each other, they will most likely not succeed at all at the collaborative game. But interestingly, this is slightly different online because whenever you join an online game, you're playing with random people most of the time and slowly while playing the game, you learn to trust certain people or distrust each other. Or perhaps you distrust that particular person with a weird nickname or you trust the other person because that person has got an avatar or show that you really, really like or the same avatar. But you quickly build your trust or distrust with other players online. It's the same around the table. And that's a game design idea, quite simple, to be the person, to be to have, sorry, game design elements that seed elements of trust and distrust as part of your game design. And the idea of seeding distrust is quite common in games because the idea of earning trust is a core game feature in social detection, hidden, 
hidden role games again amongst us the idea is if you are the person who kills everyone who is the traitor yes i'm trying not to talk too much about among us the idea is to gain that trust of the other players and making sure oh yeah you're not the killer yeah typical approach is uh, again amongst us oliver is to self-report yourself that works you kill somebody else and you say oh no there's a killer among us fantastic approach yeah but everyone does it nowadays on the other hand, social deduction games are not strictly collaborative. You're still playing as a team, but strictly speaking, some game designer says, hey, Oliver, that's not a co-op game. However, though, they still reinforce the notion that hidden information can hinder collaboration, a source of trust and distrust. Fantastic, had a hidden role. And a lot of those games have that hidden role of trust and distrust as traitors. Sometimes a hidden traitor, like a role that is right from the beginning. I'm thinking about the game Secret Hitler, where at the start you're being given an envelope and that shows you role that you're being given. You don't show that role to other people. So you can be a liberal, you can be someone else, you can even be that secret Hitler person. Otherwise, there's that mid-game hidden traitor where everyone is on the same play field. But sometimes right in the middle of the game, you will be told you're not a traitor. Nobody else knows that. So suddenly you trust everyone else, but at the same time you have to distrust everyone else because there may or may not be a traitor, which actually leads to the third one, probabilistic hidden traitor. You know at some point there will be a traitor. You know there might be a traitor from the beginning, but not so sure if there's one. And that is fantastic because you have to trust other people, but at the same time you have to distrust other people. It could be that there's no traitor at all. So why did you distrust other people? It's just everyone is acting weird. Why is that person hiding in the vents with a knife? Hmm, that is distrusting. Why is that person following me around? So everyone distrusts each other. And that is a fantastic gameplay approach. So uh, in those games, it's all about trying to win the game against whilst ferreting out who the traitor is and finding out if there is a traitor. And Dead of Winter is a good example for that. It is a semi-collaborative game set in a zombie apocalypse and players are playing the stereotypical survivor with some kind of uh, cowboy hat and a shotgun in the back. And their job is just to survive and survive against zombies and not becoming a zombie, just to see another sunrise. So it's all about finding food, about finding weapon, finding ammo, Find, uh, looking at lo new location, exploring new locations, sorry, finding all the survivors, finding out that survivor is a traitor, finding out who is in fact basically a standard typical zombie apocalypse, you know, like the stuff that you've seen endless times on television. Well, in that of winter to win the game, players must achieve the group goal. So if there's a card dealt out that solves the game that everyone can see, and that is a goal. For instance, a goal would be find a cure or survive for seven days. So everyone has to fulfill that goal. But also each player is dealt a secret card. And to win the game, you have to win the game as you have to win the, the objective set by the team and you have to win your secret objective. And that is quite fun because uh, you have to act a bit selfishly. You have to ensure that the team wins and you have to win as well on your own. So it's very weird to win the game as a team, but lose as an individual because you didn't fulfill your secret mission. So a typical uh, secret objective would be like hunger, or you have to make sure that you've got more food than other people, or experience to win the game, You all your survivors has an item card equipped. So you've got to find items and give your items to all your characters that you're controlling so you have to act a bit weirdly and a bit selfishly you have to go around and have some kind of alibi 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 for for some actions that you're doing yes you're going to a gas station to find items isn't that a bit suspicious that you're holding items no that's actually part of fun of the game it creates a bit of tension because those items would be useful for other survivors for other players but no that player is holding all those items for themselves why we don't know and uh, actually that could be a secret objective. But interestingly, there's also a secret objective that forces people to be a traitor and start perhaps killing other people or forcing other people to lose or to die or to be lost, surrounded by zombies with no chance of surviving. And uh, that creates a lot of tension between individual and team utility. And uh, people start acting selfishly, they start doing stuff that is less optimal, that is irrational, or sometimes very suspicious. 
However, interestingly, all of that, it fits the narrative of a zombie apocalypse. It fits the idea that everyone is out there trying to survive and they're a bit selfishly because they want to survive another day. They don't really care about all of us. And that creates interesting narrative, but also that fits the narrative of a zombie apocalypse as we've seen so many times from a television show or a movie or whatever is out there. And that is actually a good idea for game design, trust and distrust as a theme. So uh, those secret obje objectives, the secret individual goal works well in a zombie apocalypse game like that of winter, but it may not work well in other games. Because for instance, uh, you have to build around it because the existence of a team goal to gather a secret goal is consists of a player expectation. As I said, it discourages games players from distrusting it, distrusting each other. Player know that surviving zombie, as I mentioned, sorry. And yeah, all the players wonder if it would not be better to tackle things along, backstab each other. As I repeat myself here about the theme being important because it works well with a zombie game. But if we're looking at other themes, uh, for instance, Gloomhaven is a fantastic RPG co-op game and plays a dealt a secret objective at the start of every mission. But that secret objective doesn't always fit the theme, in my opinion, because in one mission, you're being part of a mercenary team, you're friendly with each other, you've got, uh, you've, you're being seen as a hero. And then in one mission, you're being told the card egoistic. So you were considered as a hero, and then suddenly you're being told to play in an egoistic way for some reason. And then uh, the sniper, who is a support character, is being told a card that has the days called Hugo or something like that, that has to be, that that player has to be next to every other melee character all the time. So it is a secret objective and they're a bit fun to fulfill, but they don't really fit the narrative because uh, it changes suddenly the story of the character, it changes the reason behind it, it changes from mission to mission and mission. And to make things worse, if you don't fulfill those secret objectives, you, you don't get that bonus, that little tick on your character card that says you can now unlock this ability or the other ability. So even though the secret objectives are quite fun, they don't really fit the theme of Gromhaven, of an RPG, whereas in Dead of Winter, secret objective and betrayal works because zombies and betrayal works perfectly hand in hand. Gromhaven, as I said, doesn't work hand in hand. So you have to ensure that the theme that you have about trust and distrust fits with the game design element. So trust game design idea, provide players with private goal in addition to a public team goal. It gives players justification for acting selfishly in ways that can jeopardize collaboration in order to create tension and space for interesting decisions. But care should be taken to ensure that this approach is consistent with the collaborative theming and narrative of the game. Which is fantastic, yeah. Another game idea about trust. The next one is task work which is the fourth one, because we discuss communication, we discuss information, distrust, trust and distrust. Okay, that should be the fifth one. Well done, Oliver, for counting. So task works as a source of challenge. Effective teams need to be successful at both teamwork and task work. Task work in a game or board game would be specific tasks that players perform while playing a game, like the dice needs to be rolled, cards need to be shuffled and distributed, decisions need to be taken, things are to be solved in the game, bosses to be fought, enemies, levels to be explored. Those tasks, and uh, they should be accomplished as part of a team. However, what can a game design make those tasks harder or more fun to accomplish in such a way that collaboration or betrayal is more challenging? There's quite a lot of solution that, that, that surrounds the idea of limited chaos. So the idea, the simple one is would limit the amount of time available to complete a task. Left for that does that very, very nicely that you've got zombies spawning more and regularly to ensure that players don't have too much time to complete a given task, that they're being forced all the time to move onwards and otherwise they're being overwhelmed by zombies, by, by overwhelming zombies. So people, Players have to take decisions within a time limit, forcing players to have less time to discuss and plan their strategies and rush very often into bad choices. 
don't know how often I've seen that in Left 4 Dead, that we know we've got about 10 seconds to the next zombie wave. So we need to take a decision quick where to set up which weapon to take. And that leads to so much chaos because everyone's shouting over the microphone at each other. And there's no way to find the best solution ever. Standard game design, limit the amount of time. The other approach would be to change the coordination and synchronicity of players' action. To introduce controlled chaos in the coordination required for successful collaboration. If traditional game synchronizes gameplay in such a way it takes turn to act and carry out the decision, corrupt the gameplay in a way that everyone is able to act simultaneously. That happens a lot, of course, in PC games where most of the time it's all about real time. But why not add even more elements where a lot of stuff is happening? all the time and it's impossible for players to coordinate their actions. In board games, very often players are taking turns to find out uh, to do the action, to manipulate the board, but why not do everything at once? Why not have a game where it's all about choosing cards, putting them down as hidden information and then everyone reveals that secret information all at once and then that creates a bit of chaos because we're not so sure who has to go first, which action is better to go first. But when revealing those information, then you take a decision which your service goes to the other. But you also have to ensure that there's not enough, not too much communication. You don't want to tell the other player what action that they're going to take because that removes the idea of uh, hidden information. But just playing around with those game design elements, you can do a lot. And uh, Space Team does that really, really well. And the idea of Space Team, you have to fix a spaceship, quite easy. The, the, you've only got five minutes, though, five minutes of real time and you've got to have cards in your hand to fix specific elements of the ship and the cards have got the weirdest names uh like uh, con oh, yeah, i can't read my screen and i forgot uh like contracting propeller yes but the idea is you've only got five minutes and you've got to pass cards to other players but you can only pass cards to the players on your left or right and you've got to communicate to the player as well which card that you want. And of course, the cards have got weird names and you've got weird spaceship names. You've got alien technology, human technology, and everything is limited by time. You've got to communicate clearly. So you've got to listen to the player. You've got to communicate to the other player. You've got to look at your cards. You've got to grab cards from other players. You've got to look at the table. There's a lot of information coming on at once. The game wants you to panic all the time. And the game also recommends to have some kind of weird soundtrack in the background and everyone goes a bit crazy and that is fantastic because it's all about panic, controlled panic. And that is fantastic game design because everything happens at once. And uh, that is a fantastic game design element that can be reused and reproduced. And if we let everyone act simultaneously, it makes it harder to collaborate to the additional cognitive load of having to worry about the player's own tasks while listening and being mindful of other players' needs and requests. Yes, too much of things can be a fantastic game design element as well. Left for that does that fantastic. So the idea is implementing time constraints. Time constraints are effective in making collaboration harder because they create an urgency that can lead to reduced coordination and communication problems. Again, Glomhaven does that fantastically. I talked a lot about Among Us and Glomhaven. Because in Glomhaven, it is a dungeon crawling game and you've got a set of cards in your hand that you don't show to other people. Those cards have got numbers in the middle that show the initiative. So the idea of it in each round, you choose two cards and then you play them face down. And the player order is decided on the lowest number, not the lowest number, the card that is on top of the, the numbers of the cards, in other words. I don't want to go too much into details of the rules. And you don't know which card, well, you know which card you're going to play, but you don't know what card the other person will play. So uh, the more players there are around the table, you have to more or less to figure out, once the cards are revealed, which action go in which order, which monster are being fought, because the monster also get an initiative number. So that creates a bit of chaos, but that creates a bit of tension and controlled chaos as part of the cooperation. So very often it leads to ways where uh, the first player pushes a monster away. Now the monster is pushed away, is a bit damaged, is wounded. But the other player who was supposed to shoot close range at that monster cannot shoot at that monster anymore because they're too far away. So they've got to move in and then shoot at the monster. That's great because now that they moved in, the third player can't move through. So they can't use that ability anymore. It's a bit of controlled chaos that is incredibly fun. And players have got to discuss ways to harness and make the most out of that chaos. 
and then the monster's action happens and kills everyone around the table. Yay! Nah. <laughs> Glomhaven's absolutely fantastic. Draws off the line. So yeah, the other idea is when everyone acts at the same time, it's harder to coordinate, thus collaborate. But harness that as an idea, make everyone collaborate and act at the same time. It's harder to collaborate, it's more harder to coordinate, but that generates a lot of tension, a lot of fun around the table, a lot of fun within the game. So go for it. Whew. All right, I've discussed quite a lot of things here over the last uh, 40 minutes, and we're heading slowly towards the conclusion. Throughout the talk, I built on existing publication or existing game to highlight assumptions that play tend to be competitive and does have a hard time practicing collaboration. However, that stopped the talk, I said that this assumption is wrong, that people love actually collaborating with each other and they love actually games where there's a bit of co-op. And uh, especially shown as recent uh, trend in game design, like I mentioned Left 4 Dead, I mentioned Among Us. There's a lot of collaborative games in board games, like The Law of the Rings from 2001, Marvel Legendary, Pandemic, other collaborative board games, but those have got elements of competition as well. So we examined, we looked at players have, are great at collaborating. However, though we question how this might affect the game design elements of collaborative game. So yeah, we looked at a lot of games. We looked at, um, as I mentioned, a couple of games that they have ways to have bits of competition. They have ways to hinder or corrupting collaboration to create challenges to lead to game design experience that are interesting and rewarding to players. And we can do that by looking at information, communication, trust and task work, trust and distrust as well, as suggested by numerous board games. And that leads to different design strategies to look at the state of information, to manage interplayer communication, to reduce interplayer trust, but also introduce time limits and gameplay. Hidden information, reveal information, we can manipulate that. Why not make a first person shooter where there's as good as no information? Why not make everyone visible at the same time everyone is visible on the screen by seeing the quadrant? Oh, that's already been done. Uh, basically a local multiplayer game where you can see each other player's first person view but you can't see their models on the screen. So you've got to pick out other people's screen. So you corrupt the information or you corrupt the communication as seen in Among Us, or you change the trust seen in that of winter, you increase trust and distrust, or you change the, the time that people have got in a game. There's a lot of ideas out there. It's just a matter of implementing them within your game. As I mentioned, this isn't new. Numerous games have already got those combination of those things yeah, I mentioned Among Us, it's impossible to avoid that because they implement those very fantastically. I'm not sure if that was on purpose from the game design at the start, but that is fantastic. It's just a board game in disguise. And that generated so many stuff out there, so many memes. And the game is incredibly popular. It's impossible not to see it. And sadly, that leads towards the conclusion of our talk. So throughout the talk, I used existing publications to look critically at numerous elements of board games as an endless source of game design ideas. We explored them. We looked at possible ideas which could be potentially be taken over to modern video games. More importantly, what this talk brought were more game design ideas to you guys to create fun games, which are all about backstabbing your friend as a social group activity. And I've got endless sources. Go for it, go read the stuff that is out there. For instance, Rerolling Board Games is a fantastic book and I used quite a lot of materials from that book within this talk. Fantastic game, well, fantastic book. Uh, there's a couple of publications by Zagal, actually a lot of his game design, of the game design days I mentioned in this talk are from him. Uh, Zimmerman, Rules of Play, also fantastic when it comes to communication and hidden roles, hidden game information. So go for it out there. Question is, which board games have I mentioned in this talk? I wanted to list them. Yeah, I mentioned Tapestry, Scythe, Wingspan, Eclipse, Through the Ages, Betrayal, At the House on the Hill, Glomhavengers, Dead of Winter, Pandemic, Flashpoint, Secret Hitler, Lord of the Rings from 2001, Marvel Legendary, and all the Millions expansion, Roleplay and all the expansions, Civilization, Hanabi, Space Teams, Star Wars Rebellion, etc., etc., etc. It's very easy to get in the board game and buying one, one more, as shown in the back of my whew, endless shelf. Anyway, that's the end of the talk. Uh, why are you still here? 
while you're playing board games. That's what I'm gonna do now at three o'clock, finishing Glomhaven downstairs. Haha. -ha. All right, I'm gonna stay for another couple of minutes if you guys have got questions. If not, that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching this talk. Oliver out. <laughs>